base lines because while it might seem really simple, nothing is ever as easy as it seems. So Liz, what are the main differences between authoritarianism, if you like, and, uh, and democracy? If you listen to someone who many people in the audience will have already come across, namely Samuel Huntingdon, the late Samuel Huntingdon of Harvard University, uh, the main difference relates to uh, elections. He's what we often call a democratic minimalist, meaning that as long as you've got regular, free, genuinely competitive elections, that's democracy. Now, the minimalists, so-called, are a minority amongst most specialists on democracy. Most people say you need much, much more than just regular and competitive elections. You need, for instance, an active and well-regarded civil society. You need free media. You need a business sector which is not under the control of the government. Um, these sorts of factors. You need um, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, of course, we're all... Oh, it's not working. Okay. Uh -oh. Can you hear me? Did you hear uh -oh. me what I said? Feedback. You got feedback going on. I think I'm gonna t I'm gonna take off. You are. It's not working. Is that okay now? Yep. <laughs> yeah, we're sounding good. <laughs> now authoritarianism um, is a situation obviously it's linked to the notion of a high concentration of power in the hands of either one person or a very small group who are not in any meaningful sense subject to popular uh, control. That, those, that's the most basic difference. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, um, am I working or do I need to? I'll leave. I'll leave. I'll leave. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Les is right. There's a sense that democracy is a whole, about a whole lot more than elections, you know, freedom of the press, freedom of association, all of those dimensions. But I think the, the, the authoritarian side is actually a little harder to pin down in the sense that um, authoritarianism applies a degree of, you know, the, the key concept is authority and authority um, being concentrated usually in a very small number of hands and usually subject to no meaningful external constraint where I think one of the key features of democracy is there's always limits to what the state can do. Now how those limits are played out, whether it's by judiciary, whether it's about rights, whether it's by uh, electoral campaigns or whatever, um, there's usually a, pr a pretty clear line that's policed between what, this, where the, what the state can do and what it can't do. With authoritarianism, all authority vests in the state um, usually in a very small number of people, sometimes a single individual, um, and that there aren't those constraints. And I think that's, the, that's probably the big point of distinction that, that, that I think you need to bear in mind if you're trying to work out about where democracy, where the line between democracy and authoritarianism is. If, we were, if Les and I were in high lecture mode, we'd start talking about forms of authoritarianism and soft, hard, benign, you know, malign. Uh, but also the other one that's thrown around a lot is totalitarianism and the extent to which you have an authority where, you know, if you think of a spectrum, you normally will have at one end totalitarianism, where, which is the, to you know, the totality of society is controlled by the state at one, at one extreme or to, you know, open democracy with clear constraints and limits at, at the other with a, the sort of authoritarian model sitting in a, in a, a kind of spectrum in the, cent in the centre or the spectrum between totalitarian and democratic politics. So if you look at, if you look at preconditions um, for an authoritarian state, if we take three countries, if we take Turkey, Russia and the Philippines, would you, Les, would you put them in the same camp? In my opinion, the best index of democracy is something that the Economist, the London Journal, uh, a weekly produces called the Democracy Index. And according to them, um, Turkey is still at the moment a hybrid system, somewhere between authoritarianism and democracy. Uh, Russia is definitely um, authoritarian. And the Philippines, um, they have four categories, full democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid and um, authoritarian. The Philippines at the moment is still classified as a flawed democracy. It's well down the list. They, they give a score for each country and so on. There's one term that neither Nick nor I thought to mention in response to your first question, in which I'd like to incorporate now, which is the rule of law. I, I think um, in terms of this notion of control, um, the rule of law and independent judiciary is critical. And I think in all three countries, I don't, I mean, I'm really a specialist on Russia and communist and post-communist systems, but from my understanding, and, and people in the audience who know more about this can correct me, but from my understanding, in Turkey and 
the Philippines as well as Russia. Russia, I'm unsure what I'm talking about. Um, the judiciary asks are very much under the, um, the thumb of the, of the government. Um, they, they're not as free as they are, for instance, in this country. Um, I mean, of course, even in democracies, you, you look at the stacking of the Supreme Court in the US according to which president is in power. Uh, if there's a vacancy, they can put someone of their political persuasion in. Nevertheless, sometimes we've seen recently even the Supreme Court going against Trump. That is one of the key differences. Which then goes to my next question of what are the, the conditions that allow a democracy to be, because often these countries begin as a democracy and end up as something else. So what, what is it that allows democracy to be you know, basically completely and, and utterly exploited? Uh, is it rule of law? Uh, rule of law can be used. Um, there's a very interesting uh, theory. I, I won't bore people with, with detailed theory, but there's something called modernization theory, which looks at the relationship between economic development mm -hmm. and political development. Sorry? That's just I can't hear you if you don't speak into Oh, that. sorry. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this started back in the 1950s, a guy called Lipset. Um, then in, uh, his theory was kicked around and so on. And then in the 1990s, the end of the 1990s, um, a guy called Adam Shavorsky and, and a, an associate of his called Limonji decided that they would test empirically the relationship between democracy and economic development. And they found a very interesting fact that you can attempt to build democracy at any level of economic development, but if, it's, if that democracy is going to stay in place, you need to have a GDP per capita. And, and they had a very precise figure. In 1997, it was 6,055 US dollars uh, per year per, cap per capita. If you were above that, um, and I'll get on to Singapore in a second, if you were above that, then any attempt at democracy, uh, creating democracy, you were likely to stay a democracy. Anything below that, it was, you know, maybe touch and go, touch and go exactly. Singapore is always taken as the one great exception to the, that proves the rule. But they said that, they then said, well, Singapore is an interesting one because the, um, it, it didn't really democratize while the, econ while the economy was, was progressing. So that by the time people started making demands for democracy, um, their standard living was already high. S Singapore actually now in the latest three, I think, democracy indices that come out once a year, is now treated as a flawed democracy. It's moved up, uh, whereas Russia has moved down. Uh, when I first was looking at the democracy index, Russia was in the hybrid system. It's now unambiguously in the authoritarian system. So, so that's a rather long-winded <laughs> way of saying that there's a connection between economic development and uh, democracy. And Nick, would you agree that it is, I mean, what, what is the, the primary thing, do you think, that allows a democracy to be crippled? Is it economic development? Is it use of, of or lack of rule of law? Well, it's a couple of things. I mean, you, if you go back in, in, in look into the 20th century, you've got plenty of examples of countries that have democratically become undemocratic. You know, Weimar Germany probably being exhibit A that we always sort of look at and, and worry about, where the ballot box is used and abused to allow small groups of people to, to seize power. And I, but the, 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 I guess from a sort of so political sociological point of view, it's the suspension of the rule of law, so the rule becomes not constrained by independent forces, but by the rule of man or rule of party. Um, it's about the constraint of um, freedom <coughs> of expression, so the ability to, to clamp down uh, on those aspects. And perhaps most functionally, it's do you get the coercive side of the state in line with um, the non-democratic forces, or do they contest them? And we've seen some examples recently. We talked at, when we were talking at lunch beforehand about Certainly in, in Turkey at the moment, the military is key to um, Erdogan's hold on power and the way he's framed it. And it's a bit surprising because the military is always thought of as um, the sort of holding the torch for Kemalism. So that's, that's a curious, and there's obviously something going on, some deal that's been struck that, or some bargain that's been struck. But think about in, in Egypt where um, during the, the uh, uprising in 2011, you had the Americans of all people, usually it was really good intelligence, feet on the ground, knowing, you know, that said that, that uh, Mubarak will stay in power because the military and the coercive apparatus of the state will keep him in place. And what no one realised was that there was actually two distinct coercive parts of the Egyptian state. There was a security force, which is basically an internal 
um, secret police and all of that sort of stuff, um, and the military. And the military had actually been marginalised. Um, and it got to a certain point, whole, we can get into the details of Egypt, but basically they swung away from Mubarak and that was the key to democratising in, in Egypt and it could be the key to kind of undoing democracy. And it's the convergence of those things and that, that will move the state down this, down this spectrum. And I guess two, other, two little points I'd add to things that Les said. Um, in the Philippines, you know, I know the Philippines much better than I know about uh, Russia or Turkey, um, we're, we're at the start of that journey if that's the right metaphor, in the sense that Duterte's flirting with um, uh, martial law, so he's declared martial law in the south because of a conflict, with probably good reason, but he's now talking about the need to do that nationally, so if that happens, that's, you know, warning light number one. Uh, he's taking on the Supreme Court, and, the ch and there's a member of the Chief Justice of the Pro Supreme Court that they're going at and essentially trying to remove her. Um, if she is removed and in place you have a, a, a Duterte lackey, then you've got another strike. Um, so I think that's, that's sort of, s they're, s they're sliding that direction, but they're not there yet by any stretch of the imagination. And, and which brings me to a question of how important popularity is, because Duterte is very popular. Yeah, and, and this is, I guess, one of the key um, inflection points, if you like, between democracy as majoritarian popularity contest and authoritarianism as you know, delivery popularity contest. Mm. So your ability to um, provide the goods, as it were, uh, socioeconomically or stability or social security, has been the key to generating legitimacy for large, you know, complex big societies that are authoritarian, that are globalised, so they know that there are certain political trade-offs that they're having to, that the political rights that they're not enjoying, but they see on balance the benefits that come from a kind of soft authoritarianism or hard authoritarianism in the case of China um, and are content to live with it on, on balance. So I think there's a kind of performance, performance legitimacy and if I'm channeling my Les lectures from 1992, which I think was called Eudaemonism uh, in the right. literature. So I, 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 I didn't, I, I got something out of my undergraduate <laughs> degree. Yeah. Listen to something. Um, but the other thing, I guess I'd want to make one little footnote about Singapore because it is a really curious political system where, you know, if we, if we put an emphasis on the rule of law and we say rule of law is really important to a democracy, um, Singapore has a kind of dualistic legal system. On the one hand, sort of corporate commercial stuff, it is absolutely rule of law. You know, you'll go and enforce contracts and IP and all of that stuff. It's always number one or number two of ease yeah. in countries for doing business. Yeah. Singapore mm. is always and it's, number one. You know, and if you're, a, if you're a business and looking about the rule of law to secure your corporate interests, absolutely. Political expression um, and say Lee Kuan Yew is a corrupt old despot, you'll discover that there is no rule of law uh, as we would understand it. So it's a, w it's a really interesting example of how it can have an almost dualistic legal system. Although in Singapore, at least, they use the law to silence opponents so that it is they will get an opponent for bankruptcy or there's no, um, there's no parliamentary privilege. So if you criticise someone, even in parliament, you can then be done for defamation. So at least they use mm. the legal system. I suppose that's why arguably that's a positive. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Liz, let me, this sort of brings us to, the, I suppose, the, the crux of our topic this morning. Uh, the role of corruption. Is there a link between corruption and authoritarianism? There is, but it's complex. <laughs> um, basically, if you look at the, you, you mentioned the Corruption Perceptions Index, which is produced once a year by uh, Transparency International, the, the global main anti-corruption NGO. Um, if you look at that, um, you'll see very clearly that the countries that come out, uh, with the exception of Singapore, that the countries that come out as the least corrupt are in general the ones where the rule of law is dominant, where um, the media are relatively free, and so on, democracies. Mm. And in fact, that is New Zealand, I should say, is the, <laughs> is the least corrupt country in the world, according to this index. This, this year, mm. yeah. It's, al it's always the Scandinavian countries, Norway, sw Sweden, Finland, Denmark, yeah. Denmark yeah. and uh, plus New Zealand, and Singapore. I mean, Singapore's sixth in, in some years, Singapore has been number one. It's, it's always the Scandinavian countries, New Zealand and Singapore. And some have said it's nothing to do with rule of law and democracy, it's to do with size of, size of the population. There is some correlation there. However, if you look at the other end of the, that index, you'll find there are some small countries at the, at the very corrupt level. Now, to, to the, there is no question that the more authoritarian systems um, are perceived to be, and measuring corruption has been 
uh, something I've been doing for many years or trying to. Measuring it is, is always a bit of a, uh, it's not a very scientific project. Um, but to the extent that we can measure it, uh, the more authoritarian systems are more corrupt. So Russia actually is, is relative to its level of economic development, Russia is the most corrupt country on earth, uh, as I say, relative to its economic levels of development. Um, China actually does a bit better than Russia. Uh, the Philippines does a little better still. Uh, Turkey is similar level to uh, the Philippines, according to this index. So in which order does it go? Is it authoritarianism thereby corruption, or corruption to authoritarianism, or you can't do that, you can't divide it? There are people who will tell you that we can pr produce causal relationship proof. Um, I, I actually think it's a chicken and egg thing. Um, there are some, um, Nick mentioned totalitarianism, and some analysts of Russian politics have pointed out that probably the least corrupt period in recent Russian Soviet history was under Stalin. So uh, there are writers I, I can think of that have said if you want to get rid of corruption or, or keep it to minimal levels, you either want pure democracy or as, you know, as pure as you're going to get or totalitarianism. And um, um, but I think that if you, if you think of a country in the world which is democratic but also in which corruption is a huge endemic problem, um, it's the one that we, you know, for which in Asia at any rate there's most hope is pinned by liberal, democ liberal Democrats, that's India. Uh, and you know, I think it's, it's a good example of there not being, you know, I, I think not being simple answers to say corruption equals authoritarianism, authoritarianism equals corruption. Often corruption is just at, at an everyday level a means through which people kind of make ends meet. Um, and you know, uh, often people say in India, you know, this is the land of bureaucracy, it's got all of these un uh, unbelievable <coughs> um, Byzantine rules. And often they're there to provide the scope for corruption. They're not, you know, and, and that they persist because you've got this economy of corruption that, that creates them. So I think that to, sh to say there's a clear line between the two, there's, there's clearly some kind of relationship, but I think it's pretty complex and like Les, um, there are some people out there who think there's a causal relationship, but I, I'm, we, we are not amongst them. Uh, but the, the flip side on the corruption story, of course, is, is China, where corruption is a huge problem, and it's a huge problem not just for people in their everyday lives, or a huge problem in terms of misallocation of resources in the economy, but it's a huge problem for the legitimacy of the Communist Party. Uh, and Xi Jinping has used a, a, a vast anti-corruption campaign to do not only a kind of classic strongman tactic of marginalising opponents and potential centres of power um, that are not him, but also trying to re-energise the party and re-kind of renew its legitimacy in this big, complex, increasingly middle-class society where, you know, the party has hung its, it, its cause for being and its justification for its central role in everyone's life um, because it, it serves everyone and, and, it, and its position benefits society as a whole. If, as a party, it's seen as basically fleecing people and a means to kleptocracy, then that will not only misallocate resources and all that sort of thing, but pull the rug out from under them in terms of the, the political, political legitimacy. So corruption's a problem for authoritarians in a lot of respects, and Xi Jinping knows it. Not, and it's not just what he's doing in China is not just about securing its own power. It is about burnishing um, or, or rejuvenating, if you like, uh, the, the Communist Party's power, authority, and, and place in society. He wants it to be a, an institution that people will go to and turn to and look up to and admire, not only for narrow, selfish political reasons. I think he thinks, he, he believes in the mission, if you want to call it that. So it's, I think, com the relations between, between authoritarianism and corruption is a, is a complex one. Perhaps I could just add to that, but one of the reasons that, uh, of that corruption seems to be more of a problem in authoritarianism is back to this notion of free media, <coughs> that in countries where the media are allowed to engage in investigative journalism, in general, uh, you get less corruption. And the people that are skeptical about the perceptions index, it's based on perceptions, uh, I can tell you there's another index called the Global Corruption Barometer, which doesn't just ask about perceptions, it actually asks people, have you paid a bribe uh, in the last 12 months? And when it was first mooted, th that would be included as a survey question, uh, a lot of specialists said, you're kidding, aren't you? People aren't going to answer that. Well, just look at the results. Um, we found that once that uh, uh, respondents 
believed that their uh, responses were going to be treated uh, in confidence, then you couldn't stop them <laughs> talking about <laughs> it and complaining. I mean, Cambodia, 84% of respondents saying in one year that they paid a bribe. Uh, and they were angry about it. And this is another issue that I might just raise here about the notion of normal. Um, a lot of people say, well, in you know, Malaysia or Indonesia or, or wherever, maybe Australia, um, it's normal. Now, there's at least two meanings of normal. Normal in the sense that it's the norm, um, it's what everyone does, but it's not a normative. It's not you thinking this is right or this is acceptable. You know, th there's the, the person who thinks it's their part of everyday life, irritating, but it's not a big deal. The other meaning of normal is, yes, that is the norm. We have to do that to get by, but we'd much rather not have it. And Russia, which I, I work on a lot, uh, and I, I, I look at their surveys, um, Russians do not like corruption. I've just uh, read the most recent survey. 66% of uh, Russians saying they were strongly opposed to corruption and that the government was very corrupt and so on. And yet they still vote for Putin. Um, so, so what about, um, I suppose, the state of democracy, if you like, because you know, the number of articles that have been read about a Brexit followed by Trump, followed by the rise of the right in Austria or Germany, I mean, do you see, uh, do you see a link there? And what, what is it that is causing this rise of populism, shift to the right? Is it just a, a, a whole swathe of people who are feeling left out of globalization? Yeah, it's a, it's a complex phenomenon, but I would, I, don't, I would start with a couple of variables. One is neoliberalism, which has been spread since the end of the 1970s, since Maggie Thatcher really pushed it which has led to increasing inequality. Um, I mean, you see, in this country, the rich and the poor are getting further apart. Um, and, you know, uh, this weekend, we've probably all heard on the news um, criticisms of the, the, the tax uh, reforms and so on and so forth. Um, so that's one side of it, people feeling increasingly outside. In the case of Europe, there's also the whole migration, immigration issue which in turn is related to the Middle East problems, uh, Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa, countries which um, many of them have not benefited from globalization. So even the globalization phenomenon is a complex one. But the neoliberalism is very much an ideology that is related to globalization. Globalization has had some good factors. I'm, I'm a great fan of uh, Joseph Stiglitz's analysis of uh, globalization where he looks at both the positives and the negatives. I mean, China, you, 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 you've spent a lot of time there. When I first went there in 1980, I was saying at lunch, in 1980, the main noise on the streets was bicycle belts. Now, it's Porsches and Mercedes and Audis and BMW, Balmain, their horns. Um, it's incredible the change that has occurred there. And that's one of the reasons that an authoritarian system in China uh, can, can continue to exist, as long as that economic development is happening, and they're well above 6,055, although actually, if you include the, the rural areas, not so much above it. Um, um, but if that uh, economy starts faltering, which could happen quite quickly if there's a trade war, uh, we've got problems. Yeah, and I'd echo a couple of points that Les made and emphasised, particularly the cultural side of this, yeah. the, the Trump especially story. I mean, that's the one thing where the research is already showing us pretty clearly um, that the Trump phenomenon is largely a cultural one. That's to say the predictors of if someone's likely to vote Trump is not where they stand economically, it's not whether they uh, have lost their job or are marginalised, it's do, essentially do they feel a degree of cultural resentment about the changes going on in American society and if so, they're very likely to, to be a Trump supporter. So what may at first appear to be a fairly typical story of economic grievance and alienation is in fact a cultural one. And that may be, I don't like the fact that my country, that's to say Trump voter, is increasing, is one in which women play a greater role, in which black people, people from abroad, people who don't speak English, people who don't look like me are increasingly the norm and they're pushing back against that. And you see echoes of that in, in parts of Western Europe. But I, mm. you know, the political scientist in me sort of says, we, we want to see global trends, but actually you probably want to be really careful about cross-national comparisons because I think the drivers are quite different. But the other point I'd make about um, the democratic um, ebb tide, if you like, because certainly 
you know, that, that the democracy index that the uh, economist runs has, you know, there are fewer full democracies now than there used to be by all of the various measures, things are going backwards in a lot of countries. And the ones that I think are most worrying is things like political participation. So if you look at voter turnouts in, in, uh, in elections, so Trump, one thing about Trump is no one was enthusiastic about this guy. You know, that he, he won states um, by large margins, but with the actual vote, the total number of votes he received was lower than um, Clinton received in 1992. You know, so, so that the, the absolute number of people who are turning out to vote is, is, a, is, is hugely problematic. And that gets to some deeper issues that I think uh, that, that we need to pay attention to in liberal democracies. And that is, I think, the inability of our political institutions to keep up with the changes in our societies. Um, and the most, probably the most, dis probably the most obvious form this takes is in the political parties themselves. So we have in Australia, the US has, the British have, electoral systems that are designed to favour two parties to keep, to produce stable majoritarian democracies. And that's predicated on the assumption that the parties are able to be nimble aggregators of interest groups that bring coalitions of different voters together and represent their interests at the, at the governmental level to get consent, to get legislation through and to, and to be reactive to society. Um, I think it's pretty clear by the, the, this ex, the position or the standing with which politicians and political institutions are held here and in the US and the UK that that isn't happening, that the parties are not being able to reflect changing, changing configurations of interests. It's not surprising, for example, that the Labour Party, which is a party here or in Britain out of organised trade union movements, have real problems because union participation is just in a long-term secular decline. You know, in Australia, it's like 19% of the workforce is unionised. If you take out, take, go outside the state sector, it's about 11%, sometimes single digits, depend, depending on industry. So as a, as a way of reflecting interests, a trade union party is actually probably not a good way of configuring that to the circumstances. So I think we've got these big long-term problems with political institutions that is creating alienation that is then exacerbating the sense of um, <coughs> cultural marginalisation which allows the room, room for the unthinkable like a Trump or Brexit would like to, to step into the space. I'm, I'm going to open this to the floor to questions in a minute. So it's just like... I'm oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to ask though, is, is there some <coughs> of the, um, the detractors of Trump often seek comfort in the fact that there are strong democratic institutions in the US and I'm interested in whether there is a view that those institutions have been weakened by Trump or they are proving an effective, uh, you know, stopper. Well, this, the, the American system is designed that the branches of government will constrain each other. And they're, they're all equal, no one's superior. Although the executive over the past two decades <laughs> has become a lot stronger than it has probably been at any point in American history. Um, and so far, you know, we're 12, what are we, 14 months into the Trump administration and almost as a week goes by, you're kind of like, we think at this point, <laughs> right now, we think things are okay, but who knows. Um, but in terms of the, the core stuff, um, are laws passing, uh, are courts passing rulings that everyone accepts and not being contested? Yes, so tick, that's okay. Um, is Congress able to, is, is Congress being overridden by the President or President overriding Congress? <coughs> so far, no. So again, tick, it's okay. But I think the, the, part, the level of partisanship in the United States Congress um, and the extent to which Republicans at the moment are prepared to put up with and apologize for things that their president is saying, which you know they don't believe in, but they're doing for purely partisan reasons, is very disconcerting. And the sort of thing that you could see, for example, with the Mueller investigation, um, if Trump fires Mueller, are the Republicans going to stand up? Because that's, that's, you're in the realm of constitutional kind of question marks there. And I, I cannot see for a moment a circumstance presently in which if Trump were to fire Mueller, um, the, rep the Republicans in Congress would respond. I think they're sufficiently quiescent um, that we would have a serious problem. So I'm, I don't think we're about at the precipice of a constitutional crisis and America is not in a Weimar moment yet. Um, but <laughs> it's, you know, seven more years of this yeah, I'm, very, I'm looking forward to the, um, the midterm elections mm. later this year um, because at the moment it seems to me that the more that Congress acquiesces to Trump's craziness, <laughs> I'll be controversial, although probably not so controversial, um, the more they acquiesce, I think the Republican Party is going to be in trouble. Um, 
you know, let, let's not forget that Hillary Clinton actually got more votes, but they've got a strange system, the Electoral College system in, in America, which most parliament, well, parliamentary systems don't have that. I think that presidentialist systems um, are actually in more trouble than parliamentary systems, but I think one of the, um, we've mentioned, we've, we've mentioned uh, populism and so on. The other thing I would mention is hung parliaments. You look at how many hung parliaments we've, we've seen in the West in the last five to ten years. <clears throat> These show very divided societies. And when you haven't got a majoritarian perspective, uh, you know, most people thinking, yeah, this is basically the direction we should be going in. That, in, in many ways, worries me even more than populism, which I hope and trust is a fairly transient phenomenon at the moment. But I, I hope I'm, I'm not wrong on that. Well, of course, they're very good at hung parliaments in this country. Um, let, let me open this to the floor. If you've got a question, please just give us your name and your organisation if you wish. Um, we've got a question. I mean, have we got mics that are going to get to people or just ask people? Just, just, just bellow. Just speak with a... <coughs> bellow. <laughs> So it's a deliberate policy, is what you're mm. saying. It's interesting um, that th this connection you make between um, improving standards of living and democracy. And I think in most countries, if, you, if, if people are told you have to choose between more democracy and static living standards, or rising living standards and less <coughs> democracy, they'll choose the latter. And I, I, w I wouldn't even be surprised if that were true in this country if we conducted a survey. Um, I, th I think this thing about corruption is interesting, uh, going back to Russia, that in 2011, 2012, uh, there were lots of allegations of electoral fraud. And what did Putin do? He introduces much tougher laws against protesting, against demonstrations. And the one time since then that we've seen mass demonstrations against the government uh, in Russia was last year specifically about corruption. Uh, if, if he'd been allowed to run, the, the one person who could have, I don't think he'd have beaten Putin, but Putin's uh, majority would have been reduced, is a guy called Alexei Navalny, who is the leading anti-corruption um, candidate or person, um, civil society person in Russia. But the judicial system has been used to, to treat him as if he was a criminal for embezzlement, I ironically, he's been treated as if he himself is corrupt. Um, he, he, the, the demonstrations followed a drone. This is a, an interesting aspect of the people fighting back against authoritarian systems. Um, Navalny used drones to go over um, big mansions and so on, saying that Medvedev, the, the prime minister, owns or has access to this. Um, so, I mean, we've been focusing on the authoritarianism of, the, of governments and painting a pretty dark picture. But there are some signs that civil society can fight back. We'll just see who's going to win. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the, the, the interesting ways in which corruption are used for political advantage in authoritarian countries is, is kind of client building and then, and also building kind of networks of, of um, entrapment, if you like. I mean, that one of the advantages Xi Jinping has is that essentially he's got something over everyone because every single member of the party, once you get to a certain level, has committed some kind of corruption of one form or another because that's the way business was done, so to speak, for, for, for decades. So um, it, it, I think it has a very deliberate, in some cases, a very deliberate kind of political function about aligning interests, about providing ways in which you can bring people with you by showering them with economic goodies, which then provide opportunities for others. And, and as you said, it's not dissimilar to other forms of rent-seeking or kind of feudalism and the like in which in which that's ways of organising political favour, and I think that I think, but you've got to see it for what it is, and it's not, and you don't see it everywhere in those in those ways. And corruption, 
you know, as, as Les was hinting at, corruption is it's actually really difficult to pin down and define. It's very it's extraordinarily hard to measure because of its kind of protein qualities and a degree of the, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, mm. But I think I think the point's a, a good one that we've got to pay attention to, that it has a political function and, and that and that can cut both ways. Part here is the question was, should there be more focus on the people that we are electing and who they are? Better qualifications. You should have to sit an exam or something like more than that before you can lead something. We, can, we here in the higher education sector can help you. <laughs> um, but no, no, I, I'll just say a couple of things because Les is better on this than I am. But I think we've for a long time have, have sort of people have argued that the, the business of getting elected has nothing to do with your qualifications for running government. And that there's a bit of a bit of a problem in that, and kind of Trump has dialed that up to 11 or 11,000. Um, but I think there's always been a, a, an issue, whether it's in presidential politics because you vote for an individual, even in party politics, where um, uh, sorry, parliamentarian parliamentary system, where you know only one electorate will vote for the for, for the prime minister, um, and mostly your success or failure works on the ability to work a party system and finding favour with 32 kind of you know, party room voters in the suburban seat of wherever. Um, and the attributes that will win you that fight and will win you the election have very little to do with your attributes to, to govern. Um, and to go back to, to Ali's point around Singapore, this is one of the things that Singapore have uh, long argued, which is we, we, politics gets in the way of technocratic efficiency and that, um, that the system that Singapore has rewards talented policy makers rather than than politicians because politics is a different game from, from running government. Um, so in some respects, I think what we're facing today is actually nothing really new. It's just perhaps a slight, it's an accentuation on the, the, the problem that representative <coughs> democracy, you know, I, I often say to my undergraduates, politics is one job for which you need absolutely no qualification. And you can be the Minister of Defence with the biggest budget, biggest single line item budget in the Australian government and know nothing at all about defence. And is that a problem or is that a good thing? I suppose it, but it also raises the question if you get to a point where you said before that um, even if you survey people, you would rather have a, a good living standard than necessarily a completely free society. And if you look at politicians in Australia and if you think of just Victoria at the moment, I mean, it's you know, a huge road project is on one minute, off the next, on the next, depending on who's in. It's just mind-bogglingly stupid. <laughs> I mean, there must be a, a point where a population sits back and thinks, well, you know, maybe democracy is not working. You know, maybe we need to do something else. The Chinese have certainly been making this point very strongly um, that, um, that, I mean, Trump is great fodder for them, saying, look at what happens when, you, when mm. you've got... When you have a vote. <laughs> when you have a vote <laughs> and someone who doesn't understand his own political system. He clearly doesn't understand the Constitution or know the Constitution, etc., etc. In terms of the qualifications, um, I'm back to my point that parliamentary democracies work better than presidentialist democracies. I mean, there aren't many presidential democracies amongst developed countries. Uh, for a long time, the US was the only one. Um, more recently, we've got Chile, we've got um, South Korea, but they're, they're relative, you know, in the right. grand scale of things, pretty new. Um, so I would say that in parliamentary democracies, you, you have got usually well-educated people having some control over who becomes prime minister, who, who is the leader rather than the head of state. Um, <coughs> You, you just said something else I wanted to... What, about whether we should try something else? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Be careful um, what you wish for. I yeah, think. well, I was... Yeah, I started about Xi Jinping. So, um, uh, you know, there are some people who say that Xi Jinping has just uh, changed the constitution to, s to stay in power until he dies, probably, um, uh, which is, is possibly true. Um, um, but it's he, unlike Putin, has a real picture of the future. Whether you agree with it or not is, is you know, up to you. But he does have a view forward. 
Putin is a complete opportunist. The trouble is that you know it's serendipity whether you get a Putin or a Xi Jinping. Uh, I should mention in the context of Xi Jinping and corruption that others have said the real reason he's done it is because he has trod, trodden on so many toes so, and affected so many tigers, high-ranking uh, party officials, uh, that he's scared that uh, once his term of office comes to an end, uh, he'll be in a Sarkozy or Chirac position. Chirac, the French pri uh, president at one stage, as you probably know, um, was, uh, was charged with corruption. Not, not as the president, but uh, as he, when he was the uh, mayor of Paris. Um, and um, he got off by claiming dementia. So, 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 so I don't think Sarkozy is going to be able to do that. But, um, but there, you've got, um, there you've got democracy working, to my mind. I mean, even if they get off, at least mm. they, they don't get off scot-free. I mean, their reputations are besmirched. Do you think there's another country we didn't talk about with South Korea? South where Korea. You, you often will find where every president to the present one yeah. has been up on corruption charges. And yet it's considered a democracy, is it not? Yeah, yeah. But they, yeah, but they deal with their corrupt uh, yeah. presidents. Uh, Just take them, take them a while. It takes them a while. Yeah, and, and again, to go back to India, I think one of, the, one of the things that people in India will say, often kind of bemoaning the fact that we can't be a China, we can't just build um, the, the superhighways through villages, we can't, that's, there's a kind of democratic tax that we have to pay, so to speak, in terms of economic development. In contrast, China says, you know, that's our advantage, is that we've got technocratic capacity, we've got a vision, and we can just put our foot down and, and, and make it happen. Um, and where, where you, what the trade-offs are you're prepared, with which you're prepared to live, I think are, are you know, very important questions to ask. And as Les says, I think if you put them really directly in those terms, I think we liberal Democrats would probably be a little uneasy with how people would answer those questions. Yeah. yeah. So, I guess to, to give democracy its due, I mean, I think what you get with democracy that you would lose if you have any other system is how you make that choice, how you make that decision, you know, what direction does a society go down and who gets to decide. So if you concentrated instead of that one word on the sort of elements of the architecture, like the voting mm. process, maybe you need member proportional voting, and if you committee structures, what do you need in play? That, that's sort of the point that yeah. you could make. But I guess, and it's yeah. also what... What stuff's not touchable? You know, what are, uh, do you yeah. have a bunch of things that are package of rights, for example? There, there are, no one can touch yeah. those, which you know, incidentally we don't have in this country. No, no. Um, rights. We've got sort of messy common law kind of fudge around it. But, uh, and I think one of the risks you have with, with an authoritarian kind of per purely performance-based, you know, standard of the living focus is you get yourself away from um, the, or you, you net really s narrow and concentrate um, the voices who can be heard about what, what it is you can and can't do, what it is you can and can't say, all of those sorts of things, I which... Think quality of life, not yeah. standard of living. I think it's a really no, no, yeah, no, indeed. But, but I think the, the question... I, I, in some of those yeah, but I, I do think that we sometimes forget that in democracies, I think rights are really, really, really important conceived as... You know, conceived in a very in individual sense. Um, they're a key part of the, the liberal tradition that I think we sometimes overlook, when, which is understandable in big complex societies, particularly emerging economies, where um, the trade-off between individuals and groups is, is less clear-cut than, than our own traditions. But I think from a purely democratic point of view, I think one of the advantages that you have in that society is the ability to have the conversation about the kind of society you want, whereas authoritarians, you don't. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with pretty much everything that Nick just said. Uh, in this particular country, I'd, I'd go for longer terms of um, you know, three years to me, uh, as, as mm. Ali mentioned about, you know, East, I presume of you were thinking of the East West Link, um, you know, 1.1 billion or whatever it is to, to pay off the contractors. Uh, I know I, I, I teach every year in China, um, and um, 
every year when I go to Beijing or maybe every two years, there's a new metro line, not five stops taking 10 years, but 15, 20 stops done in a couple of years. I mean, there are things that authoritarian systems do very well, some, but the, the trouble is we're still back to this, this point that it's so dependent on one or two individuals. Um, Xi Jinping, as I've said before, um, he's got a, a real vision for China, whether you agree with it or not, and seemingly for the rest of the world, but increasingly with his Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but supposing he goes wrong, he, he goes off, off track. I wasn't suggesting that. <laughs> no. What's the architecture of what we now call democracy? Or is it? What's the architecture? Do we need to look after ourselves and one another? What are, what are things we need to have? <laughs> I guess that goes back to, to that point. There is no, I, I, sorry. Go I think one of the mistakes is to think that there's an optimal architecture that's out there. Yeah. There isn't. You know, they're all, yeah. they've, all, they've all got advantages, disadvantages, they've all got costs and benefits, and there's, all the, there's a degree of path dependence. You know, you can't just start with a blank piece of paper. Yeah. Or it's, it's a very, very rare and very unusual, and certainly absent some cat catastrophe um, of a kind of systemic war kind, you ha you, it's always going to have to be reformist. And so I think the, the, the thinking through what mix you've got is about just how you can tweak what, what structures you've got, and probably more importantly in the current climate, how you can protect what you've got. Yeah, I was actually going to raise that, because in, in this country we are actually rapidly losing our freedoms just uh, you know, courtesy of our current government without necessarily having the conversation around it. I mean, if you look at our new um, Home Affairs Department and some of the rules and regulations about detaining people with, on terrorist charges or terrorist assistance, and there's a lot of change happening, and happening under the guise of protection, but not necessarily the discussion around it. No, and that, that's, I'm glad you raised that, Ali, because that is a very important point that in the West generally since 2001, since September 11th, 2001, um, we've been told that our democratic rights have to be constrained because of threats from terrorism. And that can be exaggerated. And uh, that's one of the areas we really have to look at in terms of quality of life. Um, it, I mean, I'm, I'm with Nick on this question of liberal democracy. I'm a Churchillian. Um, th those of you who haven't come across this, that Churchill basically said, democracy is the worst kind of political system apart from all the rest. <laughs> um, that's one aspect of it. Another aspect is that, again, in line with what Nick was saying, democracy is not a finished product. It never can be. The whole point is that it's a process. There is no end point. And the third point, and another reason why I'm a Democrat for one of a better uh, a vision of something better, is because of the old law that democracies don't go to war with each other. There's no exception to that rule, is there? You're the IR specialist. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. Not, not yet. Well, trade wars, of course. <laughs> we're, we're about to enter one, I think. Yeah. But uh, an actual hot war. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, okay. We've got time for just one quick one, so I'll just grab one at the front. Okay. So I just want to ask you that uh, how much the corruption is related to the ethics and the morality of the society? So not just the leaders, but the whole society. Well, so. um, earlier, Nick very rightly um, focused on, on culture. And we know, looking at the, um, at the indices, that there is a close correlation between culture and, and uh, corruption. So, for instance, Protestant countries come out as the least corrupt. Um, people have got theorised about this, that it's to do with the Weberian uh, approach to ethics and so on. Um, unfortunately, once you get beyond Protestantism, it then starts getting very fuzzy. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to start using statistical terms, but there's a, a thing called an intervening variable which says that sometimes, for instance, Islam, a lot of the uh, perceived to be the most corrupt countries um, have, have a, a, Muslim, a Muslim tradition. But is it really the religion, or is it the fact that the countries are poor? Um, same as criminality in individual countries. Is it the fact that it's a particular migrant group or so on? Or is it the fact that that migrant group is being marginalized, is treated badly, can't get jobs and so on? That's what we, the intervening variable is the cultural one. The real variable is the poverty and the inequality.
I just want to finish by asking both our guests just a, a quick question. And I know that you re mentioned some research about um, the fact that there are, you know, more democracies are under threat, if you like. But in fact, some Pew Research Centre uh, numbers put out in 2016 said that we actually, the number of democracies are on the rise. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious to know whether you are both optimistic about the very broad trends, and this is a huge generalisation, but um, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? I'm, I'm in a pessimistic m frame at the moment on this. I think 2016 was a more optimistic time than 2018 is. I think we've seen more steps backward. Um, but I would qualify that by saying it depends on where you look in the world. So I think, um, for example, the region I know best, um, Asia, democracy is certainly in retreat. And not just democracy, but I think liberalism in general um, and liberal ideas. Uh, now, I, don't, I think the big mistake we all make, both in the 90s when we were being optim really optimistic about this stuff and now when we're being pessimistic, is to assume it's all one-way traffic. Mm. So that's to say when, when we became more democratic in the late 90s, early 2000s, it was a, it was, we were only going to get more d democratic and that once you get an advance, it's locked in for good. Um, and I, but I think that's also true now. That's to say w as we seem to be retreating to some degree from liberal ideas and, and democratic principles, it's a mistake to assume that, we, w that, that that's a one-way street, that those freedoms and ideas once given up or, or walked away from to a degree can never be picked up. So I think, I think we're, we're in a bit of an ebb tide in Asia, wherever you look, and that's both the sort of newly emerging democracies that are going, slipping back rapidly, like Thailand, um, or, po or possibly uh, the Philippines, or whether they're quite unquote old established Asian democracies like Japan, where by a lot of measures, you know, that's a country, press freedom, uh, and the like, where, you know, we've taken some pretty significant backward steps. And in Australia? Um, and in Australia, no, I, I think so. I think Australia is clearly over, a, I mean, over the, where are we, 15 or 16 years, you know, we've taken clear steps away from, from the sort of principles um, with, with which we like to associate ourselves, a bit like the national cricket team, to choose a moment of the, you know, it's, but, um, but I think that just because that's where we are now doesn't mean, as Les was saying, it's always going to be there. We, the, the, you know, radical change is always driven by young people and Asia is a young continent. Um, and I think that the sort of frustrations that young people will feel across the region, I think, give us pause to think about both the, the sources of those frustrations, but I think to recognise the political opportunities that frustration and mobilisation can bring. So I think I'm pessimistic about where we are in the short run, but not necessarily in the long run. By nature, I'm a glass half full person rather than glass half empty person. Um, I do share a lot of Nick's pessimism at the moment. Um, but there's one concept which we haven't mentioned at all today, and that's social media and the internet. Um, I, I said I teach every year in, um, in China. And last year, for the first time, my students were really whinging about the fact that they, their access to the internet was, was being reduced. And of course, from the end of this month, March 2018, uh, China is going to try to block nearly all foreign VPNs. Um, that, I think, could backfire. Um, you know, authoritarian regimes at the moment, there's the so-called Great Firewall of China, the Vietnamese, another communist, so at the, at the pointy end of authoritarianism, uh, they just put in a new, um, uh, a new uh, 10,000 person team to vet the internet. This is bad news. The, the Russians are certainly doing it as well. But there's going to, you know, there, there will be a backlash. And these young people that uh, Nick mentioned uh, are often smarter than the middle aged bureaucrats working for the government to, to deal with the middle aged and older people <laughs> dealing with the internet. So I think. One possible hope is social media. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Ahmed to come up for the formal thank you, but if I can just uh, thank my panellists very much for being so generous with their thoughts. <laughs>